Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we are here another week. Yay. Good for us, man. We're doing, we're doing hot. We're hot. We're hot. What can I say? <laughs> um, this week we are talking about uh, Rob, Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner. I was going to say Carl Reiner. I'm like, no, that's a, that's a wrong Reiner. Um, Rob Reiner's uh, Misery, based on Stephen King's best-selling novel, um, I wanted to bring up to you, Jeff, um, right off the top that, uh, Rob Reiner directed this movie and the, the guy who adapted the book into a screenplay, William Goldman was the writer of the book, the princess bride. He also, I believe adapted his book into a screenplay and the man who directed the princess bride was Rob Reiner. So we have Rob Reiner and William Goldman back together, working, joining forces in a completely different type of film, but it works. I think that the magic here lives. Um, so let me get, let me rewind a little bit back. Um, I am here, my name is Jesse Drew. And I am here as always with my brother, literally in law, because he is Jeffrey Watson Esquire, the third lawyer to films and lawyer to any horror movie that needs defending. Myself, you can call me Dr. Jesse Drew, as I am the psychologist to all films, film characters, especially the villains, because as we all know, villains rock. And Jeff, do you root for the villains? I do. Uh, I do. Okay. Okay. Because I, I never wanted to assume. I know I root for the villains in almost every instance, but I didn't know if you did. So a lot, way like way too much. And it's honestly, it, it when we watch these movies, like I actually catch myself sometimes, like wait, I'm cheering for the wrong person, or I'm <laughs> like, hoping for the wrong person. You know, they don't need my sympathy. They don't need, you know, for whatever reason, no matter what the film is. So, uh, so yeah, I find myself doing that. But we left people off with a teaser last week. Who picked Misery? Was it Dr. Jesse Drew or was it yours truly? So, Jesse, reveal who picked Misery. The big reveal is that... I'm pointing, trying to point at Jeff, uh, Jeff, the Watson, the Watson man. He, uh, he picked it. Attorney Watson picked misery. Ooh. And I think it was a fantastic pick. I, I kind of forgotten about this movie. Not for, I mean, it's in the pop culture lexicon. It's, you know, all of us who were around when this movie came out, will have it in our psyches, you know, but thanks for choosing it. This was a really fun, uh, flashback yeah yeah it it took me back and i i mean i just remember my mom going to a video store and getting this and she like we're sitting there watching the first little bit of it and then all of a sudden that changes and she's like go to your room I'm like, <laughs> what? What? i mean i no, i want to watch it and she's like no you don't need to watch this and you know i ended up convincing her to let me watch it and Aww. yeah so you know she was cool like that but yeah i remember her going to the video store uh if we have younger listeners um my goodness you missed out on such a great um such a great pastime yeah uh, for us but but yeah it was a i i have interesting memories of this movie so uh so yeah it was interesting to go back and watch it you know again as an adult to uh to break this down as an adult to break this down is exactly 
uh, what I think, you know, we're here to do today because my goodness, as you would say, my goodness, I remember this movie very differently uh, than, how, than how I saw it this time around. There's so much, uh, there's so much, especially now we're in an age of, well, I think we're like entering an age of more of like more of an awareness of mental illness. And, you know, for folks who are just joining us for the first time, Jeff and I tend to talk and discuss mental illness, mental health issues, mental awareness, mental health awareness uh, on the show. Um, and, you know, we joke and stuff about me being a doctor and psychologist to the movies, but, you know, we really do try to give uh, these movies a fair shake under the microscopic lens of psychology. Um, it's like a jumping off point. You guys know, you guys are smart. Um, so with that being said, let's jump off and get right into misery. Um, as I mentioned, this is, you know, based on a Stephen King novel. It does, it does stray on some big scenes from the book. I did not read the book. I want to read the book. I will not be reading the book. Um, everything I've read about the book suggests it's extremely dark, way darker than the movie, uh, with a lot more uh, of a sinister feel. Mm -hmm. So in order to preserve my own mental health, I'm going to be skipping uh, it this time. And maybe, maybe this summer, if I'm feeling better, I've been kind of struggling lately. So maybe this summer, if I'm feeling better, I can attempt it. Um, but uh, Jeff, have you, have you read the book? I started it way back when mm -hmm. and never finished it. And it's one of those that I, I mean, I have a copy of it at some point. I'm going to read it. I, for similar reasons, I will not bring that out right now mm -hmm. because, you know, I too have been struggling some. So, uh, so it's not something I really want to dive into at the moment, especially if it's more sinister than what we got on screen. Uh, and if it's darker than what we got on screen, then, you know, I definitely don't need to dive much further into that. But yeah, uh, but yeah I um, my plan is to pick it up and start over and finish it. Do you remember like do you remember why you put it down to begin with? Was it, you know just not the right time was it kind of boring a little bit at the beginning or something i'm just wondering i just think it was, just wasn't the right time i had so much stuff going on at that time from a i, I was trying to you know pursue a, an athletic career and all that good stuff so it's like i didn't really have time to to do it because i was training you know maybe five hours a day or something wow. like that and then you know trying to work a full-time job and it just it wasn't a, a good time to to do that so, so yeah the book is heavy too in terms like literally heavy i think it's like uh yeah. something like almost 400 pages or something he really uh anyway people love it it's it's you know it was a bestseller for a long time um and we opened the movie um with some really cool music, some Motown, I think it is. And um, basically we see uh, James Kahn, Jimmy Kahn, if uh, some people will call him, <laughs> um, a favorite of mine. Um, he has finished writing a book. We don't know, like it says, it just says untitled. So we don't know what book it is. Um, he's finished writing his book. He celebrates with his cigarette and a glass of Dom Perignon. He leaves the inn where he's been staying. It's all snowy. And he's in a 1968 muscle car, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, and he's got New York plates on it. And I'm thinking to myself, like, as a New Yorker, what the heck are you doing? He's like, he looks like he's in Colorado. We're not told right away where he is. We find out he's in Colorado, you know, um, in the mountains with like snow everywhere and he's just driving like you know like it's 60 degrees in LA you know and he gets caught in a and in on a quick uh, a, a rapid approaching blizzard and his car flips over and you know falls down into a ditch and that's the end of him you know so we think and then he gets rescued by uh, Annie Wilkes um, who is played by Kathy Bates, who won 
both the Golden Globe and the Oscar for her performance in this movie, which is, let me just stop for a second and say it's impeccable. This yeah. woman is an incredible actress. I mean, we all know that, but I think this was where, like, the cat, the we love Kathy Bates, you know, love boat, you know, set off and set sail because she's so amazing in this movie. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would love to have a conversation with her on how she got so into the character of Annie Wilkes, because this is a woman who is deeply disturbed that we will come to find out, but I'll get back to that in, in later. Um, so uh, we've come to find out that, um, you know, uh, this woman rescues James Kahn's character, his name is Paul, and she has him uh, resting in a bed all, you know, like with his arm in a sling and his legs are all broken. She's taking care of him. She's a nurse, we come to find out. She's also, as she says, his number one fan. And it's just, you know, a message from God. She says that, you know, she was meant to save him. Um, and he's drifting in and out in the beginning. He's not well. He's still like probably concussed and has all kinds of broken body parts and stuff. He's It was a total wreckage of a car accident. Um, and he's very lucky to be alive. But he is not lucky to be alive at Annie Wilkes' house. <laughs> so... Uh -huh. No. So she tells him that the roads are all closed. She can't, so she can't bring him to the hospital. The phone lines are down, so she can't make any phone calls, but not to worry because she's a nurse and she's giving him uh, Norval, these pain pills that he's taking um, for his, you know, extreme pain. She's um, given him these, you know, good like splints for his legs and all this stuff. And he's all right. He's going to be okay. She's feeding him. And we start out with Annie. Basically she looks like fresh as a daisy, you know, she's just smiles and, you know, kind of like, um, almost like, like, yeah, like Midwestern charm, you know, like she doesn't swear. She, she does not like swearing. She doesn't like, you know, lots of like little little kind of like a ways that people have nowadays. She's very kind. She's very sweet. She feeds him by mouth. She's, you know, emptying his urine jug. I mean, she's a full on nurse taking care of she, as she keeps reminding him her favorite author, she's like, Oh, I love you at one point. And she kind of catches herself and is like, Oh, you know, uh, I mean like your mind and your talent, and he's like, don't worry about it. I got it. I got you. Because Paul can see right away that something's not right with this woman. We only have Paul's reactions to go on. And see, that's the thing. You know, we all go into this movie, you know, knowing like the trailer with knowing the story, knowing he's trapped in this house with this woman who is like a, a stalker fan of his. Um but really, if you don't know anything about the movie, it builds a nice, it, it builds a nice suspense. It builds a nice, like, to a nice crescendo. Where I had heard that the book, you're kind of treated right away to know that Annie Wilkes is not a well person. Annie Wilkes is a violent person. Annie Wilkes is like, dresses like disheveled, she's dirty, she's not well kempt, and she smells bad. Like in the book, Paul describes her as having the worst foul stench of breath. Like it's really gross because she just doesn't clean herself. Um, in the movie, we get Kathy Bates looking very crisp, nice, you know, and just always helpful and cooking and all this stuff. But she does tell him right off the bat, like, that she's his number one fan and that because of that, she has known that he stays at the inn where he stays at to write. And that, you know, maybe a couple times she sat outside staring into him and trying to stare into his window and looking to see if the light is on, which it's funny, but when she tells it, Jeff, I mean, I don't know if you, if you, if you kind of got this, it's weird. It's because like her performance, the way she's saying it, sounds like almost innocent, like someone just describing that they have a crush on someone else, you know, yeah. but like, 
I mean, you, but, but to see his reaction, which is very held back, but you can see that he's holding back is like, you're realizing like, she's a stalker. And I know we wanted to talk about this because we did stalk timber last stalk, stalk timber. <laughs> last at the end of last year where we did all the movies on stalkers like what are your thoughts on that like someone tells you that they're but someone with Kathy Bates's sort of kindness at that moment tells you that she's been maybe she's like hung out outside your hotel room a few times what what do you think about that if you're Paul I have the same reaction maybe even I couldn't have held it back um, you could definitely tell that he that he was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, seeing her say that it's like it, it's almost like she has an internal struggle in ways because I get the sense that she knows that it's probably not the best thing to do, but she's rationalized it in her brain. Well, I'm his number one fan. You know, I know I know he likes to have a glass of Dom. I know he likes to have a cigarette and the one match. You know, like I I know all these things. I'm just a fan. It, I'm not doing anything, you know, to to be to be, you know, stalkerish or or anything like that. You know, I, I just care about him. I, I really want to meet him. And the reality of it is, is that I when it comes to being a fan, it's okay, like maybe once. And I, I mean, I've done this where I've seen a band and I found out where they were staying in terms of hotel. And you just drive by just to see like, you know, I wonder if they're outside or I wonder if they're going to party. That's like one thing. But to know, okay, well, when they come to town, they like to go to this restaurant. They order the number six off the menu the one person has three blocks of ice in his water. That's room, yeah. you know, like that kind of thing. It's it's like, okay, I that's going too far. That's taking it too far, and I almost get the sense from Paul that he's dealt with this before, but maybe not to the level of someone actually going so far as to admit it. And say it open openly without any kind of shame or guilt to it, because honestly, it just looked like she didn't. Totally. I totally got that feeling too. Like he's well, he's well rehearsed and like holding back what he really might be thinking and just being gracious, like, okay, thank you. You know, like that's very funny. Like, wow, you know, you did that. Great, you know. And for sure, she's like she's just like, oh, I probably shouldn't even tell you. Like that kind of an air about it. I don't know that she literally says it, but she kind of says that. Um, I mean, that kind of like, that pretty much leads me to my next point that I was going to say was that like, just in terms of the, you know, the plot and the machine of the movie, Paul realizes pretty early on before she starts demonstrating it to the audience, really, that she's not a well person. She's not, she's just not like right in the head. Um, we are treated to several scary moments in the movie. And I'll just go ahead and say that like, basically the, the, the motion of the movie is that Paul is literally trapped in her house. He can't, walk he can't move his legs they're severely like they're broken and it, they show a shot of it which is body horror hello yeah. uh horrible and she um she knows this you know in the book actually she um a little a little thing is that in in the in the novel he becomes addicted to the painkillers that she gives him which use you know she uses that as like leverage on him she knows that he can't leave now on top of the fact that he's because you know he starts getting better at, at one point you know his legs are getting better weeks go by like he's able to be more mobile she gives him a wheelchair you know yeah. um but in the in the book she's like he's not going anywhere he needs these painkillers but in the movie we don't get that he is just um at one point he stops taking them because he realizes they, they make him pass out and it's just too strong. So 
Um, I did want to bring up a few scary moments. Um, like, ooh, scary moments in misery. Like there aren't, you know, there's no shortage of them, but some that I found particularly scary, horrific, crazy. <laughs> and and it, and I'd like to hear what you think, Jeff. Okay. Um Annie snorts like a pig. That scene where she introduces Paul to her pet pig, Misery, and she's chasing her around like, you know, it's her pet. People act crazy around their pets. I, I act crazy around, around my pets. Do I ever bark at my dog? Do I ever meow at my cat? I might have meowed at my cat once or twice. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but like, she turns around and and like starts snorting like a pig and acting like a pig to Paul. I just Freaky. I had this you know I had the same reaction that I'm having now. I remember my jaw dropping and being like, "That's terrifying." Jeff, Freaky. thoughts? Freaky. I mean, I and it's funny because obviously you know watching it as a kid, I laughed. Hysterically. Yeah, I'm like, "Oh, she's acting like a pig." Yeah. Uh, but now, as a grown behind man, if I'm Paul, yeah, uh, right. I'm, I'm hoping that she emptied out my jug because I've got to use it again. You know, like right. that that kind of thing. Like because that was terrifying to me Be because it's it's kind of fitting for her because in at certain points there's this animalistic anger and rage and you know just so many emotions that are so raw and kind of um i don't know i mean i i don't know a good way to describe it but it's just that in in that moment i figured out like okay yeah this is paul's gonna have a pretty rough time yeah um, yeah <laughs> yeah, she's she's yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's an animalistic type of rage. I mean, what's yeah. on the flip side of humor? It's rage. You know, that's that's yeah. that's your psychology for today, boys and girls. <laughs> um scary moment, and these are all out of order, so they're not, you know, whatever. Um okay. I will build to the scariest moment, in my opinion. Um uh, scary moment. Uh, number two is Annie is severely uh, depressed and shows Paul her, her handgun. Yeah. Very scary. Because the last thing that you want to do is be in a house with someone that you can't move around very well. And they're doping you up on pain pills and they show you a handgun. Mm-hmm. Like if if I don't comply, will I see this thing again, but not in a show and tell kind of way? Yeah, I mean, it's also she gets the depression, that severe depression. She looks it. She looks it in her face. She looks it in the in her clothes. Uh, she sounds it in the way that she speaks. Um, to me, the, um, the scariest quote was uh, in that moment, she says, um, you'll never know the fear of losing someone like you if you're someone like me. And she just, then she's like, shows him the gun and is like, I'll maybe like she, it's so scary. Cause she's like, I don't know, like maybe I'll go put some bullets in it. It's like that. Look, you know, we're, we're, we discuss mental health issues. Like, yes, I have been that depressed where it's like, it's you're in a black hole. There's no other way to describe it. There is nothing that can get through to you. And so the way that she says that, like, I don't know, maybe I'll go put some bullets in it. Like she's announced, like she's saying something that's so dangerous and like 911, you know, needs to be called. But the way she says it is just like just so lost and like just like it's nothing. Like, I don't know, maybe I'll go put some marshmallows in my hot cocoa. Like, because she's so freaking racked with depression that I just thought 
I was like, man, that lady earned her Oscar for this movie. You know, that is, in my opinion, uh, it's such a brief scene. And I mean, that's all that we need for the movie. We don't need more because it's not a movie about depression. But when they do those montages of like people in movies that have mental illness and stuff, they need to throw that scene in there because that's the black hole that depression gets to when it's really bad. So uh, tip my hat, Kathy Bates. Um, scariest moment in the movie, in my opinion. Drum roll, please. Thank you. Seeing the tire in the snow when Buster the sheriff goes like walking down the hill to see if he can find any trail of Paul's car or of him. And he's like, all right, I guess there's nothing. And his wife calls him back up. And she, so he turns around and starts walking back up the hill. And the camera just lets you see that he was just a few feet away from seeing the tire of Paul's car, which is obviously covered, the rest of it's covered in snow. And it just terrified me to no end. That shot was just perfect. I was like, that's horror movies. That's exactly what it is. It's to get under your skin. It's to let you see that this person is still in danger. And they were so close because it's like in real life, stuff like that does happen. People get kidnapped, you know, and it could be that they were so close to being rescued and they weren't, you know? So I don't know. What are your thoughts, Jeff? Did I get that kind of right? And there's so many scary move moments in this movie. Yeah. I mean, for me, we're going to come to a moment. I don't want to say it was scary, but it was, it hurt. That's all I'll say for right now. But um, yeah, this was terrifying because like you said, a lot of this happens in the real world. And that's what's so scary about this movie is that this could this could happen and be on the news. And I don't know that anyone would really bat an eye. They'd be like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> some people fill in the blank, you know, like whatever. Um, so for them to get to this point, to be so close to, you know, to to providing some, some help earlier rather than later. It's just it like, it tears your heart out because it's, I mean, he's, he's helpless. He's helpless at this moment. And, you know, there, there are some, and by the way, I got to say this while we're discussing it, I, I absolutely love the characters of Buster and Virginia. Oh, hell Yeah. I, yeah, they. I mean, I love them. They provide the right amount of comedic relief at the right times, because otherwise it's a heavy movie. Um, but honestly, with this movie, and this is kind of like a master, <clears throat> a master class in how to have a, a successful psychological thriller, uh, because in those yes. moments. They they could have they could have very easily done something like shot another camera angle or they could have zoomed in and did something like that. But no, you give us the wide shot. And there were so, there were some other scenes where we get the wide shot. They do such a good job with the camera techniques, like using the dolly to go in close on the face, the close ups, you know. The lighting in some in some ways, it, it's just it cap it captures the mood in those particular moments. And that and that's what I thought about that. Like if I if I were just kind of a fly on the wall, so to speak, and I see this sheriff so close to seeing that, how would I feel from a you know from a, a wide view? Like if I'm just looking in on it and they, they capture that moment brilliantly. Totally agree. Totally agree. Especially, yeah, I mean, that's psychological horror for you, you know, because that's, that's tripping all of us out, you know, it's making us mad. It's making us frustrated. It's making us feel so scared. 
because we know that help isn't going to get to him. I mean, we just said it, so I won't go over it again, but yeah. Um, I also wanted to bring up um, a lot of people, a lot has been uh, written um, and dissected about Annie Wilkes' character, Annie Wilkes, um, the person, you know, like if she was, et cetera. Um, forensic psychologists, um, lay people, everyone kind of has had their shot at like describing what her mental illness diagnosis would be or diagnosis would be. Um, people have said everything from, you know, uh, bipolar disorder, which I don't personally agree with, but um, to, Sorry. I don't agree with you know, that. yeah, I don't agree with that. Um, to psychopathy, it, you know, of uh, what was the other one? I think like this, just you know, being a celebrity stalker, being like having the profile of a celebrity stalker. Um, that I can, I can kind of, see, I can see that. You know, we, it's funny as we were talking before. We never really, I mean, I never really, I don't think you have either. Like, just identified this movie, Misery, as like a stalker movie. But she, for all intents and purposes, you know, was stalking him to, to a lesser extent, or at least obsessed with him. Um, so I would just chalk this as as a doctor of psychology to the movies and to villains, especially. I would really say that Annie Wilkes has an amalgam of she's made up of an amalgam of mental health issues, serious ones, severe ones. Um, but I, I don't think that there's one that you can just, you know, is she a sadist? Yes. Is she also, you know, um, have, you know, severe depression? Yes. Like she's got so there's, there's so many aspects of her that obviously fit for a novel and for a movie, uh, Stephen King, just like Stephen King, um, described, Amy, someone who came to him in a dream, he dreamt, he had a dream, a very vivid dream where this story actually came to him. Um, and she was very well defined in the dream. Um, he's also described the book as being him. There are parts of Paul that are him, you know, which make, I mean, he's a writer. He's writing about a writer being held hostage. Right. And what is the writer being held hostage by? Like, you know, someone who's inflicting pain, someone who wants him to write, someone who's obsessed with him personally. Um, I think these were all things that he was going through. He has admitted as much that Annie represents, um, to some extent, represents uh, his battle with uh, cocaine and alcoholism. He was, if, if you don't know, um, and, you know, I don't have dates or anything, but Stephen King had a really intense cocaine addiction. I don't know what else he was addicted to. I know he was also an alcoholic. Um, the man struggled for many, many, many years um, with those demons. So this book sort of put it out there also about his fans, about how they were disappointed with him at that point in his career, about sort of being beholden to writing these um, scary, you know, thriller books that he didn't necessarily want to do anymore at that point. Um, so it makes, I don't know, I, I find it always interesting whenever the artists will give up <laughs> what their meaning is behind their work because so many times they don't want to give it up. And I get it. They don't want to discuss it. You, they always say like, you know, everything you want to know is right there in the work. Just take from it what you will and whatever you think is that's what it is to you, you know, which, you know, I get it, you know, that makes sense. But also sometimes you just want to hear the the artist tell you like, yeah, this book is totally about this or like, yeah, the, the song was totally about this or whatever. So, um, so yeah, so, so she's holding him hostage. All right, let's go back to the plot. She's holding him hostage. She's like, you know, let's just drop the pretense you know, I never called anybody. The lines are open. I never called anyone for you. No one knows you're here, um, you know, and no one's coming. She gets really pissed at him because he has killed off the main character in the Misery series. The Misery in this in this movie has a double meaning. The Misery that he's in, that she's inflicting on him, and also the name of the main character of this series of romance novels that he is well known for. He is a super famous author, much like Steve. 
um, known for this one genre and this one character who Annie is obsessed with. I mean, she goes on at length in the film, the pig is named after misery. He kills her off. He sees um, that he needs to, Paul needs to exit this series of books that he's created. So he has this latest, this latest um, installment of the misery series comes out while he's held captive at Kathy Bates's house, at Annie Wilkes's house. She gets the book. She's all excited to read it. She comes back in when she's done and she's ready to kill him because he has killed off misery and she loves misery. And she like, you know, breaks a piece of furniture over his head. We get, we get the threat. He gets the threat. He gets it loud and clear, you know, and then she comes in and sets up a, what she says is a work studio for her writer. And he's, and she, him she has him a typewriter paper everything he could need and she has said you're going to uh write another book another misery book and you're going to bring her back to life and he's like no i'm not and she's like yeah you are and she makes him light the book that he had just finished that he was had in his briefcase when he had the accident um she makes him light on fire he tries to get out of it. I thought it was clever. He was like, oh, well, I've already sent a copy to my agent and everybody has it now. And she calls him on his bluff and she's like, and this is where the stalker thing comes in again. She's like, I know you haven't because you never make more than one copy because you're superstitious because I heard you say it on Merv Griffith. And I was just like, wow. He's, yeah. And then, and he, the way that he, and he just sort of like, just basically did what you did, Jeff. He's like, Phew. You know, and he just goes like, uh, Merv Griffith, huh? And I just thought to myself, that's that time period of like, you know, like the 80s, 90s, whatever. That's their version of putting stuff up on social media, like yeah. telling talk show hosts about, you know, giving real stories about their real lives when people who are not well and who are obsessed will glean from those interviews as much as they to get at them so she knows all this stuff about him in fact when buster shows up at her house which he does um the sheriff um he's like what can you tell me about paul uh paul what's what's his name i forget the last name uh, anyway. uh, is, uh, hold on uh, is it paul sheldon paul sheldon there good call Good call. Yes, Jeff. Jeff, I keep pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> Whatever. Um, he's like, what can you tell me about Paul Sheldon? And she's like, well, he was born in 1942 in Des Moines, Iowa to, you know, Minnie and Jeffrey, you know, uh, Sheldon. And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't need to know that. Yeah. I just need to know if you've seen him. <laughs> like, you know, I thought that was really funny. I, I thought she did that really well. Also, uh, let's take a moment to say that Buster deserved better. Okay, Buster deserved better 2021, all right? Because that's my new campaign, hashtag Buster deserved better. Buster shows up. He's the one that even after the FBI and the state troopers have declared Paul Sheldon dead, he's the one who's like, mm, not really. No, I'm going to keep looking into this. Like, even though the case is closed, I'm... I'm Something's not sitting right with me about this. He's a way better detective than anyone else is in the movie. And he gets, you know, he finds his way over to Annie Wilkes's house, exactly where Paul is. She has shoved Paul into, she gives him an injection of like a sedative and shoves him into the basement. Buster comes by. We all feel like he's the deus ex machina. He's the one who's going to, you know, rescue Paul. All signs point to this because throughout the whole movie, it's he's been slow paced, but he's been after what happened to Paul Sheldon and he's read the books. He's just done everything. So we're like, cool, he's going to rescue Paul. Paul sees his car coming, sees that it's the police. He's excited. Buster starts looking around. He asks Annie, can I look around? She's like, yeah, I'll make you a cup of hot cocoa. And I'm like, don't you dare drink that. Do not put anything from this house in your mouth. Anyway, 
Um, and he doesn't, he's very smart. He's just like, Oh no, thank you. You know? And she tries to like shove it to him and he's like, no, thank you. And there's a very funny scene where they both lean back into their rooms. She's off to make him hot cocoa. And he's like looking around in the guest room and they both lean back and then they both lean forward <laughs> to like, see if the other one's still there. Like it's just, it's good. It's, it's perfect. And Richard Farnsworth is the actor's name who played Buster. He's one of my favorite character actors. He is yeah. just, he does, he does this really well. Um, uh, so yeah, so he's looking around, he goes upstairs, he goes downstairs, he hears something, he opens the basement door, he sees Jimmy Khan laying on the floor, you know, just like barely able to like, he's trying to make noise to get his attention. And he's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, it's Paul Sheldon. And then he gets blasted from behind by Annie Wilkes with a shotgun. It just like blows his chest wide open and it's from behind too so it's like oh man and he just falls down the stairs and then there's that's you know that's the hope it's just gone and i don't know i mean again hashtag buster deserved better so yeah. we are almost we are almost jeff i am almost not you because you would never forget this. I'm almost forgetting to talk about the most famous scene in this movie, which I think that's maybe is that the moment that you were alluding to before. <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, no, I don't want to. Is that the mo moment that you were alluding to? Yeah. So, all right. Let's set this up. Annie discovers that Paul has been escaping his room. He had fashioned like a key out of a hairpin that he found. He's been escaping the room, looking around the house, trying to like, you know, figure it out. Um, he comes across this scrapbook, old time memories or something. It says this big red leather scrapbook. Basically it lets us as the audience know that Annie is a serial killer. She has been murdering since she was young. She's been, uh, she's an angel of mercy that they call it, like nurses who kill, like, like totally defenseless and helpless people, like babies and old people, which is exactly what the articles in this scrapbook tell us. And, you know, in the book, you would hear, you would, you know, know more of this history just vis-a-vis -vis the book, but this is, I mean, this was a good way, a quick and dirty way to like, let us all know, like, yeah, she's been accused of murder. A lot of babies died under her care. Uh, a lot of old people, she's, you know, her father died, her neighbors died. Like, let's, you know, put two and two together. And then he, and he sees the article that says like Paul Sheldon, you know, beloved author missing, et cetera. And he is terrified at that moment because it's like, this is her, this is her scrapbook of her, you know, like how they serial killers have their like trophies and stuff. This is her scrapbook of her, like, you know, you know, awards, so to speak, like all the attention she's gotten for all the things she's done. So he's terrified. She, at one point like says like i know you've been escaping your room i know you've been leaving your room and we're gonna fix that right now and she describes hobbling someone and how and then she puts a block of wood between his legs at his ankles takes literally takes a sledgehammer and goes at it to each foot at the ankle and he just pretty much passes out in pain. And as, as you know, um, which is, and, and afterwards, what, I mean, the most disturbing thing, and the movie knows it, is that afterwards she says to him, like, oh, God, I love you. Like, as if she's just done something that's almost sexual in nature, you know, just like, like, she's really given herself to him. And like, they've really been through this, you know, intimate thing together. Whereas she's really just inflicted, and I mean, you, you can't you can't put words to what she just did to him in that yeah. moment. 
And she just goes at it with such ease. It's like not even funny. It's, you know, crazy, just it's straight up crazy. And, you know, in the book, she, what she does, she actually chops off a foot with an ax and then cauterizes it with a blowtorch, which I, I'll be honest with you, Jeff, I, I got to ask you this. I don't, I personally, I don't know what's worse what happens in the movie or what happens in the book? Because I, I think like, you know, there was some like, you know, kind of argument about like, you know, what happens in the book is way too much to do on screen, et cetera. And there was some, you know, Oh, back and forth about it. But what do you think? I can't decide what's worst up to be honest. I'll tell you what's worse. Taking a sledgehammer to the, to the ankles. That's worse. Because while, yes, it sucks that the foot is cut off, I mean, at that point, it's cauterized, you know, it, it is what it is. Having, going through that pain where you go, and it's not like she was incredibly swift with this either. <laughs> she hit one leg, la -de -da -de -da -de -da. okay, let's hit the other one, bam. You know, that's both of your legs permanent. I mean, you can't tell me that there is not permanent damage there. You no, know? I mean, we we see him walking with a cane at the end yeah. of the movie, which is. Yeah, I mean, he's. I don't know. I think he'd be using if he was walking, I think he'd be using those um those braces that people walk with with the with the steel, you know, whatever. Yeah, because I'm not I'm not really buying Walk. that. Just a, a walking cane is not going to help that. So, no, but honestly, to me, the actual physical horror and the violence of it wasn't the scariest part to me. It was when she said, God, I love you. And, and like you said, there was there was this you could see there was this arousal and euphoria by her maiming him to the point where he can't go out, he can't get up and venture out anymore. He is solely dependent upon her again. And that scrapbook is essentially her manifesto of these people depended upon me and I put them out of their misery. Oh. You know, like I, I put them out of that. Yeah. Uh, stick a pen in that one. Um, <laughs> I, like I put them out of their misery. They should be thanking me because I did them a favor. Mm -hmm. Like all I did you a favor by breaking your legs again, because you were going to end up doing something that you shouldn't have done. You're going to end up going to a place or, you know, escaping the house and you're going to get caught out there and no one, you know, I mean, you're not going to get rescued, that kind of thing. I'm doing you a favor. I'm doing, I mean, don't you see that, Paul? I mean, in those moments, that's kind of how it felt when she said, God, I love you. Yeah. It's like, wow, that is terrifying to me. So terrifying. Because it's just, I mean, it's one of those moments where you have a person that clearly has, you know, some type of issue going on. And the very destructive thing that they're doing, they see as a complete positive because things just aren't connecting for them. Like there's just something there, you know, something's misfiring where, you know, just, it's just not connecting for them. Totally. Totally. And I got to say, for all these reasons, I, this is not a villain that I root for. This no. is not a villain that I was rooting for at all. Anyone who would just, so they call the angel of mercy like that's so horrific i hadn't i hadn't ever heard of what that meant until today when i was looking looking that up i was like what does that even mean like an angel of mercy that sounds like something kind of nice you know and i was like oh my god that's what they call an angel of mercy that's terrifying that's like the most terrifying that's like my worst nightmare yeah you know I'm sure, and i'm sure you saw some stuff on uh dr kevorkian as well since you've since you saw that turn well i didn't i didn't actually but didn't. but i 
I don't have a problem with assisted suicide of people who want to end their pain. Right. Um, actually, well, now that we're talking about it, God bless his soul, Richard Farnsworth uh, ended his life. He shot himself um, mm -hmm. while battling terminal cancer. He was in, according to reports, you know, I mean, you know, who knows, but uh, he was in terrible pain. His wife had passed away already and he just, he just said that's enough you know um i don't ever know like what the deal is with dr kevorkian i think he's just assisted suicide right pretty much i, I think it yeah i mean i think it's well depending on what you read and where you look right there's some different things that people say um but yeah i mean it, it's one thing to assist people with you know with the end of life type of stuff, but when you're going out, oh yeah, doing what Annie Wilkes is doing, that obviously that is not even close to an apples to apples comparison. No, no, it's it's just she's just a serial killer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. It's just nuts. So unfortunately for everybody, um, like I said, Sheriff Buster gets killed, um, but. Eventually, Paul um, tricks Annie. Um, he finishes the book. He um, has her bring in, like, the match, the cigarette, and the Dom Perignon, the things that, you know, she knows that he takes when he's done with the book. And he has snuck um, a bottle of lighter fluid that he has, and he douses the book while she's out getting the second glass of champagne for her to drink with him. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. She says to him, this is wonderful. You're almost done. When you're done, I have two bullets in this gun and we will die together basically. Mm -hmm. And he's like, excellent. I'm going to put my plan into action. So this whole time, you know, Paul's been like lifting this Royal typewriter, which is like at least, you know, 25 pounds. He's just been doing his, like when she's not looking, he does his exercises with it to get his strength up. So he, she brings him in the tray of all the things she sees that the, you know, the, the book is on the floor. She's like, he's got a wadded up, ream of paper that he's like oh all the questions you've ever anyone's ever wanted to know who's misery's real dad is she going to choose like you know man a or man b like you know to marry and what's going to happen to her baby like all of those things that you ever wanted to know are right here in my hand and boom like and he lights it on fire and she starts screaming he knows where he knows now like he has to get her at her weak point which is the book and that's his only way out. And so then they struggle, they wrestle. He hits her over the head with the typewriter. She's got such a big and hard head. It doesn't do her in. They struggle more. She kicks him in the nuts, which was a ugh, groin shot. Thank you. Oh. Um, I know that was rough. And um, they keep struggling. She she hits her head on the desk or something. And, it, and it's such a bad mannequin. <laughs> like, it was such yeah. a bad mannequin. I was like, what? Okay. Um, and then he just wrestles with her. He thinks she's down for the count. She's not. And he has to bash her head in with this, like, let like this, like weighted metal door jam of like a pig. And he smashes her in the face and she just collapses on top of him and dies. And then we cut to him, um, walking into a restaurant using a cane. It said, it says something like 16 months later or whatever. And he's having lunch with his agent. He's holding up a copy of his, you know, re most recent book, which has nothing to do with misery and is like some other title or whatever. Um, and she's, the agent is telling him that he's going to be up for awards. All of the big publications are loving this book. They're all promising to give him extremely positive reviews. She asks him if he like the $64,000 question and she like excuses it, but she says like, I have to ask you, like, would you be interested in writing about what happened to you? And all the while he sees Annie Wilkes dressed up in the waiter's outfit, 
pushing the dessert cart towards them. And he's kind of very calm. He's just like looking at her and she's just looking at him and she pulls up and we see that it's, you know, you know, you get a blink and you see that it's, it's not, of course it's not Annie Wilkes. Annie Wilkes is dead. It's just a waitress who says like, excuse me, are you Paul Sheldon? He says, yes. And she says, I'm sorry, but I'm your number one fan. And he's like, well, thank you very much. You know, and that kind of cuts out of there and we're kind of done. But I thought that was a clever and concise way to show that he's never going to be, you know, rid of the PTSD and all the nightmares and stuff and of Annie. Um, I was kind of weirded out. Tell me what you think about how polite he was to the waitress. I don't know. Is that supposed to be, am I supposed to not be weirded out by that? Cause it, se it just seems like if he's having a flashback and he's seeing Annie, like that he would seem like he would look more panicked, even if he had the, Oh, thank you very much. Like polite response. You're, I don't know. I had PTSD I might still have it. I don't know how that goes, but uh, I was legit diagnosed with that. And when you're starting to have a flashback or a vision of something, you're panicking. Like that's not, you're not just sitting there like, oh, thanks very much. So nice to see you. Bye-bye. You know, like you're panicking. Even if you are saying the polite thing, you're sweating, you're, you know, your heart's racing, you know, Jeff. I mean, it's just not. So it kind of like weirded me out. Like, are we supposed to assume that even though he's seeing Annie, that he's okay? Is that what we're taking away from this? Or are we taking away, like, or is she just, what? Like, what is the, what is the takeaway? I'm so, kind of pissed about this. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the weird thing. I, I'm going to go to a place you probably aren't expecting me to go. I think we're meant to believe that he is almost grateful for what he went through. And I say that because he felt in so many ways so like pegged for a specific thing. And as a result of his trauma and everything that he went through, he was able to essentially disappear from the face of the earth People assumed he was dead and it gave him an opportunity to reinvent himself, to to come back with something that wasn't related to all of the things he had done previously. So instead of him having to find a way to break it to the publishers and everyone, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go to a different style of book or a different book altogether, different characters, all of that it was almost as if they excused his desire to do something different and it was finally paying dividends. So yes, he has to deal with all the pain and the trauma, but on the other end of it, he's now finally getting to embrace the work that he truly wants to do. And now that he's doing what he really wants to do, there's no way to to bring him back to that old and make him feel guilty or scared or, you know, intimidated anymore about what's on the other side because he sees that people are embracing his new vision and his new work. Yeah, you're right. Basically, in a nutshell, you're right. I may not like it, but you're right. Yeah. Okay. Just a thought. Just a thought. No, I, I can sense you're right. You know, we didn't talk about, which we should have talked about, maybe we'll just give like a minute to, is how important setting is to this movie and how it, it's really like the third character. Because, I mean, the most part of this movie, I mean, we do have the side story with Buster and his wife, you know, as a sheriff and the deputy. Um, but it's really just, you know, Kathy Bates and James Caan, you know, in their movie. But the setting really is like the third character you have the setting of it being like snowy colorado mm. of it being um her house and her room like that, that guest room i mean it's just where he is we see him 
when he actually starts typing and, and writing the last misery book that he eventually burns, we see him looking out the window um, and just like, just watching like the days go by, you know? Um, I, I kind of wish that they would like melt some of that, more of that snow just to give us a sense that like months are going by now, that it's not just like a week or two. I think that would have been good, but okay. We didn't get that. Um, but yeah, I feel like, and then just, we even, we even get to go into the town just for a scene, you know, a scene or two, like when, when she, when she almost has that accident and yells at the people, when we see Richard Farnsworth, like, you know, talking to the guy at the general store, yeah. but the house, the room, that's, 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 you know, that's where he's trapped. That's what he, yeah. That's him being held hostage. So I just wanted to give a quick nod to that. Um, I thought that it was pretty funny. The um, the sheriff and his wife, who is his deputy, when they're driving, <laughs> you know what I'm going to talk about, when they're driving. <laughs> And she just like starts like, I mean, and they're like, what they're like, they look like they're in their late sixties, early seventies, you know, and she just starts rubbing on his leg and kind of giving him the old like hints, like the wink, wink, you know, and they're driving to go see about this man who's missing and trying to see if they could find him or his body. And she's like, you know, rubbing his leg, like, Hey, and he's like, listen, you know, if you're in this car, you're my deputy, whatever. She's like, I'd rather be your deputy under the sheets. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> Thank goodness feisty. for them. Feisty, feisty. Yes, she is so feisty. And um, and he is so not having it at any point in this movie. He's like, woman, settle yourself. <laughs> um, yeah. I thought that was great. Um I thought of uh, I thought it was crazy how um, Annie yells out the racist, you know, yeah. uh, she, when she's talking about like, oh, the two best artists in the world, that Dago who did the Sistine Chapel, and you writing Misery, and I was like, I I missed it at first. I was like, why is she calling Michelangelo Dago? Does she not know his name? I was like, oh, because, you know, she, like, mispronounces Dom Perignon. She says, like, Dom Perignon. And she yeah. kind of, like, shows, you know, her kind of, like, small townishness in those ways. I was like, why is she calling Michelangelo Dago? That's not his name. And I'm like, oh, good Lord. Are you kidding me? In the book, she uses the N-word. She doesn't say the D-word. She uses the N-word, like, full stop. Um so, I mean, but I was just like, wow, that's just a whole nother level that of like, of, of like nastiness about yeah. Annie. And what's crazy is that I love that they left that in because she's so chipper and cheery, but you hear her say that and you're like, wait, what? Just like how you wouldn't, she's a serial killer. She mm -hmm. is. There's really no other way to say it. She's a serial killer. They're very good at masking, you know, their fiendishness, you know, um, and she does it with a smile and with all this, like, you know, like, oh, I don't, I don't swear. And, you know, all this, you know, goody goodiness, but she's, you know, a monster, she's a monster. And mm -hmm. so you see that kind of come out and it's so jarring and it's like, how can those two exist coexist and they do and you're just brought back to the fact that like these people you know are monsters and that's really kind of we can't really understand it so um any last thoughts jeff yes i have one and i'm well i'm not gonna go far in depth with it because I don't want to piss anyone off. Um, Why? Or, well, <laughs> because I mean, like I, you know, we we talked about religious stuff before, but I just I just found it. This is going to sound odd. Minus the serial killing, Annie's character is so relevant even now. Uh, because she reminds me. 
honestly, I mean, kind kind of like a, a Karen in some ways, where you know you get this person who hmm. thinks that they are being nice. They think like you know I'm I'm looking out for you. I need to know why you're in my neighborhood. Let me see oh, your eye. Yeah. You know, I, I've never seen you before. All I'm trying to do is just protect our neighborhood. And you find out that that person has some really sinister beliefs. Yeah. I was just going to use that same word, sinister. Yeah. I mean, like, is their, their whole moral code is out of whack. You know, she talks about God and praying and all of this stuff. And it reminds me, and this is this is the part that I don't want to piss people off on, but honestly, at this point, I'm just going to say it. But it honestly reminds me of people who use religion outwardly to present a facade. I hate and, that. Yeah, and then inside, internally, they're nasty. Yes, they're, they're awful. They hold on to beliefs and things that if the typical person were able to see their inner thoughts and hear their hear those things they they think that person was vile and disgusting mm -hmm. and that's what she reminded me of which made which as an adult makes this far more terrifying than mm -hmm. when I you know, than the movie I remember as a kid because right. You know, you just don't pick up on those little intricacies there. But as an adult, it's like I can see so much. Like honestly, if you if you updated the clothes just a tad and maybe the house just a tad, and I had never heard of this before, I'd swear it was made within the last 10 years. Oh, and, I can see that. Yeah. And, and Absolutely. It's, yeah, and it's primarily primarily because of her of her ability of Kathy Bates ability to bring the various facets of a person who tries to be one thing to everyone, but in reality, they're really, they're really far, far away from what they try to present. Good points. Good point. I, I took issue. I, now that you're bringing it up, I took issue with, <sighs> them having her wear a crucifix yep. that was so prominent on her person at all times. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense for the character because she has delusions that God speaks to her. You know, she says more than once, God spoke to me, God told me, God gave me a message, you know, or I knew God meant for me to do this. Like she's very, she's, you know, strong in her convictions that she hears from God directly, which mm -hmm. we, understand is you know no i don't i don't think anybody who's 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 watching this movie thinks that she really is you know because you see how unwell she is but it was hard to take because i don't know maybe i'm just because it's like you know i struggle with coming out like and, and being public about you know being a catholic and not having, not fe feeling like the world's going to come down on me because Catholicism gets a bad rap because of the politics of the church, which yeah. I am not, I don't agree with the politics of the church. So I believe in Jesus and Jesus is, you know, my love. So that's, a, that's as simple as that's as far as it goes for me, you know, but so like, I'm kind of get tired of like seeing the crucifix, like being tied to negative things. So I just, yeah. even though like I get it for the movie and I get it for her character, it kind of, it rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, oh man, like mm -hmm. we already get enough bad press. Like, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> Jesus is a good thing, man. Like <laughs> he's a yeah. good, he's a good guy. Like no, I don't want to see him like wrapped around Kathy Bates's neck. You know what I mean? <laughs> But yeah. it but it made sense for the character. It added another dimension, like you said, you know, it it added this that we all we all know what that is. We all know that 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 person, you know, uh Karen or you know, that that you know ultra religious person who's all like, you know, that's my identity and I'm so religious and 
nobody knows that I hate like crazy inside my heart, you know, and I, it did make her character more interesting, but I don't think, I think that's a really good point you bring up. I think that's exactly the kind of thing that, that um, we need to talk about on our, on our show. Um, okay. So time is here for our rating, which is like our review of the film. I mean, we kind of just reviewed it, but what do we give it? And our show, we go by the Headstones uh, rating system. We go from one to five, one being <clears throat> and five being yay. So Jeff, what number of Headstones would you give to Misery? I hate to be this transparent, but I, I have, for me, I have to give it a five. I okay. have to give it a five. This, this for me is a classic and it's one of those movies. I, I think the true test of a classic is if you update, if you can update less than 10 things and it still holds relevancy uh -huh. today. And this movie does that. Like if you switch out the typewriter for a laptop, if she breaks a cell phone. Yeah. If she has some type of scrambler there that kind of screws up a Wi-Fi signal, that kind of thing, there there are a few things, maybe five things that you could change about Misery, and it looks like it was shot ten years ago. And um, the directing, Rob Reiner, especially during this period, I don't know how many people really realize how many hits he had out around this same time period, uh, but he had so many hits. Uh, so the direction was good. The score was good. Um, the cinematography, the way that they, you know, shot different, you know, different using different techniques. There's just like I said earlier, it's really a master class in how to do one of these movies. So for that, for those reasons, I have to give it five. Have to. OK. And what about the tattoo test now on our show? We give each other the tattoo test. Both of us are into tattoos. Um, and so we would say, hey, would you get a tattoo of any image or quote from this movie? So that's what I'm asking you now. See, I feel like I'd have to get a quote. Okay. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't get any imagery. <laughs> Especially not the sledgehammer or anything like that. Uh, but I, you know, I'm trying to think. There's there's a couple good quotes in there that that are pretty, you know, that are pretty significant. Um, so yeah, I, I might have to get a quote, um, something small. But I mean, it's one of those movies where even though I love it and it's great, I'm not necessarily keen on the idea of having a reminder of how yeah. scary it was, you know, so I mean, if I got anything it'd be a quote, but you know, if I had, if, since I have to answer this question and not ramble on and on, I would say no, but I mean some of the quotes stand out to me, so um, alright your turn, first headstone rating, and then would you get some ink? Uh, that's difficult because I'm torn between four and a half and five stars. Um, I'm going to go with four and a half. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm just going to go with four and a half. Sure, um, it's your yeah. It's your yeah. Um, so I thought the movie was pretty close to perfect. Um, like you said, you described it, you described it perfectly, a master class in making a horror film. Um, you know, this is the one to judge Stephen King's films by. He liked this movie. He he wrote Dolores Claiborne with Kathy Bates in mind. He wanted her to act in it. He like loved her performance so much. And that really says a lot being, you know, the writer who dreamt this character up literally. Um, right. So I, I think that um, Kathy Bates, 110,000% Kathy Bates. All the close-ups that they do on her, she just, it's like, I mean, she, she, I, like I said at the top of this episode, I would love to sit down with her and just have her tell me what it was like, what she went 
what she went through and what she had to go through to get into Annie Wilkes's shoes. And really, cause she pulls it off like just wonderfully. I mean, she's, she's just as good as a Hannibal Lecter, you know, oh. I mean, she's just, as, it's just a different breed of monster. That's all, you know? So yes, I also, I think maybe like they, I understand the choices that the director made and the screenwriter made, but um, I feel like there are some scary things from the book that could have made it into the movie to just take it just a little bit over that dark edge. Uh, for instance, um, the, the ending in the book in terms of Annie's murder, Paul kills her, right? Like, or he thinks he kills her. They wrestle. But, and so the police come, but when the police come, she's not in the guest room where he thought like he left her and they see that the window is one of the windows is busted out she got up and actually had made it as far as her barn and grabbed a chainsaw and was coming back to kill Paul with the chainsaw when you know her head injuries just she just fell and just died of her, of her but she had the chainsaw in her hands something like that I feel like they could have they could have done something with that I don't know Maybe, maybe not, but I want that level of fear to like last at the end, you know, instead of her just like toppling over onto him. I don't know. Call me crazy. Um, and I was just still, I get you. I, I hear you. And I agree with you about that last scene where he's polite to the waitress, even though he's having a flashback of Annie, but there just is something that doesn't sit well with me about that ending. I want a different ending. So um, four and a half stars. Um, would I get a tattoo? <sighs> if I wasn't the type of person who could be disturbed mentally late, like late, like at different points, like I can, when I watched this movie, loved it, was interested in it. It didn't bother me. It didn't upset me at all. It didn't disturb me. Um, as I was doing research about the movie, I began to feel like I was getting disturbed by it a lot. And I had to stop, even though I kept pushing myself, I was like, you need to stop. Like, um, so I would, if it, if I wasn't so easily like shaken up at times in my life. So, uh, worthy of a tattoo, but I won't be getting any misery tattoos. Long answer. Fair. Sorry. <laughs> fair, no, no, fair enough. Well, we want to thank you for sharing in this, you know, lengthy discussion. I think this movie is worth a lengthy discussion, right, Jeff? I mean, absolutely. This this movie's worth is deserving of all the praise and everything. Um, I wanted to see it when it came. You know, uh, Laurie Metcalf and Bruce Willis did the play. They did a screen ad adaptation of this on Broadway a few years ago, I think. But I and I immediately was trying to get tickets to go see it, but the tickets were something like no joke, like three hundred dollars or something. Like that. Oh, I believe it. It I was it would and it was like you know and I at the time I was like I, I just can't justify that you know but um I heard that that was even amazing so all right thank you guys so much for hanging out with us um, check us out on um, Twitter we're back on Twitter. Uh, not quite there yet with Instagram, but we'll be there. Uh, you could write to us, movies to be murdered by at gmail.com. I want to thank Jeff for getting us set up on YouTube. You are the best. You are the best at this. Thank you for doing this for us. It's really cool. You guys, if you're listening to this on your podcast, we are on YouTube now and it's really fun and you get to see our cute little faces. <laughs> so we'll see you next week. I'm not going to tell you what we're going to be doing, but we do have it planned out. But we'll see you next week. Peace out. Bye-bye. Game over.